think of the past and all the foolish things I've done. I'm so glad it did not last, though for a while I thought it fun. I am all so glad that who I was is not who I am now. And the change in me, it is all because of not me, O oh Lord, but Thou. Holy art Thou, who has created me from the dust of the earth. Holy art Thou, who gave me life with planned purpose for my birth. Holy art Thou, who died to save me and lives inside of me. Holy art Thou, who never changes, yet has the power to change me. As I think of what lies ahead, all the hopes and dreams inside, my heart cries upon my bed, in prayer I confide. Thou art worthy of my whole heart, single-minded seeking Thee. Please change me in every part, Lord be glorified through me. Holy art Thou, who has created me from the dust of the earth. Holy art Thou, who gave me life with planned purpose for my birth. Holy art Thou, who died to save me and lives inside of me. Holy art Thou, who never changes, yet has the power to change me. Holy art Thou, who never changes, yet has the power to change me. If you have the Word of God, I'd like for you to turn in the Old Testament to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is where we'll be at this morning. I have a question for you today. Why are you here? Why are you here? I mean, it's interesting. You know, those of us, we know the Lord. It's our personal Savior. That we have a reason, and no doubt we would claim, of course, that we come to worship the Lord and to seek Him and to... Uh, hear from the Word of God preached. But although we would know that would be the right answer to say, is it really the answer of our heart? You know, ultimately, you can say one thing, but your heart can say another. How do our actions describe certain things? What, what does our lifestyle depict? So the question remains, why are you here today? For what purpose did you come? Well, let's go to the Word of God. And we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. In 2 Samuel, we'll begin in chapter 14, in verse number 28 is where we'll be at today. 2 Samuel, chapter 14, verse number 28. We'll begin reading there in verse number 28, the Word of God. It says, So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, and saw not the king's face. Therefore Absalom sent for Joab to have sent him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sinned again the second time, he would not come. 
Therefore he said unto his servant, See, Joab's field is near mine, and he hath barley there, go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servant set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom into his house and said to him, Wherefore have thy servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king, to say, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there still. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. So Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. I'd like for you to notice in verse number 32, the expression in the middle of the verse there, it says, it had been good for me. It had been good for me. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, shall we? Our dear gracious Savior, Lord, as we come before Thee, we are just over, overwhelmed that, Lord, You would be merciful in us, enough to us to, to hear and to know us as Your children. Lord, but we understand and know that, first of all, we wouldn't be anything without the cross of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we look to You, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we thank You for dying on the cross for our sins. We thank You for taking our our place whenever it should have been us, Lord. And we just praise your holy name that you would even allow us the grace to be able to have the strength to come to this place and to worship thee today. Oh, but Father, you know that we come with heavy hearts. We come with burdens in our souls. And no doubt, each and every one of us has something that we're dealing with, something that we cannot understand, some problem, Lord, that we need an answer to. Father, for the next few minutes of time, I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts. May you hide me behind your cross, and I pray that your voice alone would speak to us. And may you show us, Lord, that truly the vow are all that we need. Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've given to us, and we trust that you will do your work now. We commend it unto you, for it's in Jesus Christ's precious name we thank and pray. Amen. In this portion of Scripture we see it's talking about a man by the name of Absalom. And if you're familiar with Scripture, we understand that Absalom was King David, his son, one of his many sons. But there was something unique about this particular son. He was a rebellious child. He eventually led to a full-out rebellion of the kingdom against King David. And we see that his life, although it began not necessarily in a bad way, it led on the path to absolute destruction. And if you'll notice and turn over to just a couple pages from where you're at in 2 Samuel chapter 18, we'll read verse number 18 where it comes to the very end of his life. And Joab, King David's servant, his right-hand man, the captain of the guard, had saw that Absalom had gotten his hair stuck in the trees. And he was dangling above the ground, suspended between the earth and the air, the Bible says. And he killed him. But it's interesting, it makes kind of this epitaph, if you will, of Absalom's life. In verse number 18 of 2 Samuel 18, it says, Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. We see that Absalom, after the end of his life, he didn't have any children. He didn't take time to worry about those things. He was more concerned about his own agenda, his own kingdom, about trying to take it away from his father. And so at the end of his life, when he finally came to the end, he realized that he had not, the one thing that he had been seeking to make a name for himself, wouldn't even continue on. And so he made himself a pillar, the Bible says, and called after himself. And he says, it's Absalom's place. Absalom's place place. But the man didn't start this way, ending in destruction, wreaking all this havoc. As we search the pages of Scripture, the Bible gives to us an amazing account of his life. But what I'd like to challenge you this morning, as again we found in our text verse, in verse number 32, Absalom, after being brought by David back from Geshur to Jerusalem, he asks this question, he says, wherefore am I come from Geshur? Why am I here? Why did you bring me to this place? I was perfectly fine. I was perfectly content in the land of Geshur. Why am I here? And so again, I asked the question to you this morning. Why are you here today? Well, 
may I challenge you with the thought, you are here because the king brought you here. Because the king, the king of kings, not King David, the king of kings, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, brought you here. Because he saw you in the land of Geshur. And he saw you, that you were helpless and on your own, you're selfish and stubborn and knew that you could do nothing on your own. And yet he brought you out. He brought you to himself. But unfortunately, many times, like Absalom, God, why am I here? Why am I here? Well, if you notice what Absalom says after, the, after this, uh, what we've claimed is our title here, it says, it had been good for me. It had been good for me. So what was the leading cause of Absalom's life, of his downfall, the path that led to his destruction? The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Did you realize that you could be set on a path that you think is the way that even God wants you to go? It's the right way. It makes all logical sense. But you've actually been tricked. You've been deceived. You think this way is the right way. It seems like the most obvious way, the way that any person in the right man would do it, maybe even the way that God would want you to do. But it says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are what? The ways of death. And I would contend this morning that this is what Absalom found on himself. He was on this path, this way. So then what led to this? What, what was the result? What caused it? Well, I think the Bible makes it very clear in this verse, it says, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me. You know what Absalom found about his life and characterizes all his life, which we'll look at a little bit more this morning, is that he, instead of serving his king, served himself. Instead of serving his king, he served himself. What about you this morning? We could all say again that we're here for the right reason, that we're here to worship the Lord together. We're here to hear the preaching of God's word. We're here to hear from God himself. But are you really? Are you really just seeking what's in your best interest? Oh, well, you're worried what the pastor will think if you don't come to church or your friends or you know that it's a good thing to do because your parents taught you that you needed to come to church and to hear the word of God preached every Sunday. So even though you really don't want to come, you're here anyway. Or maybe you're participating in some role of the church. Maybe you're doing something or serving in the Sunday school. Or maybe you have some other type of role. And you think, oh, I, I really don't want to be here, but I know I, I've got my responsibility. I need to be at church today. Why are you here? Is it good for me? Are you here because the Lord brought you here today? Are you here because God wants you here because just like Jesus, as we learned in Sunday school, had brought those 12 disciples across the Sea of Gennesaret, he had their hands right there. He wanted them to be in the middle of that storm. Why? He knew that a storm was coming. Surely a good God, a compassionate God, a merciful God would not allow a storm to come into life, especially a storm that would allow difficulty and danger and possibly even death. But why did Jesus bring the disciples across the sea? You remember? so that they might come to him. It said, when they came to him, they came to him and they woke him up and they realized after they had tried everything in their possible power to be able to fix the problem in their own hands, they finally realized the very person that they should have gone to in the first place. Jesus was there with them. And Jesus wanted them to come to him first. And yet they came to him as the last line of defense. What about you this morning? Are you treating God as your genie, your last line of defense? You'll call on him whenever you are in desperate situation. You can't see any way out, but you won't thank him every day for the food you eat. You won't thank him for the health that you have. There are many people who aren't able to be in the services this morning because of their health or different situations, people battling cancer that we could name. And, but God's given you health to be here. Have you thanked God for that today? Why are you here? Why are you here? Well, we understand that David and Absalom, his son, did not start off this way, but it led down a certain path, this path of destruction. And so how did he lead down this path? Well, if you'll notice, we'll take a little bit of background here, just as kind of an introduction this morning. In chapter 11, something happened in Absalom's father's life. Something happened in Absalom's father's life, a discerning, a turning point, if you will, for the rest of his entire life. And if you're familiar, it says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, that this was the time where David sinned with Bathsheba, 
his life. He had let down his guard. He was supposed to be with the rest of the kings. It says in verse number one, it says, this was at the time when the kings go forth into battle. He was supposed to be there. But what does it say? He says he's tarried still at Jerusalem. And because he didn't go, he didn't fulfill his responsibility, he didn't obey what God had wanted him to do, he held back. That opened the door for temptation. And sure enough, as we know the story, he sinned with Bathsheba. And at this point, the whole story changes. The whole story changes. Now we praise the Lord for his mercy and how that David came back, but no doubt, David's poor example had a big impact on his son. So my challenge to you this morning, parents, how are your lives holding up to that of your children? You might wonder and say, well, I don't understand why they're doing this. I don't know why that they would live this way. Are they following your example? You know, it's been very convicting. You know, obviously, I don't have any children, but the Lord has blessed me with the opportunity to teach her in the academy uh, this past semester, which has been very much a, a learning experience. Um, have first through third graders, five of them, and they're wonderful. All of them are wonderful. So we have some of the parents here this morning. So they're, they're wonderful. They're wonderful children. So no, I do love them very much, and we have a great time. But one of the things that I've noticed is that they have been saying, well, Mr. Rooks does this. And Katie Delford, she teaches the other half of my class. And so in the afternoons, they'll, they'll come in and they'll be like, well, Mr. Rooks says we can do it this way. I'll say, oh, really? <laughs> we realize that whether or not you understand it, people are watching you. People at church are watching you. Your family is watching you. And those that name the name of Christ, how ought we to live? Absalom saw a very poor example in his father. But not only that, in, verse, in chapter 12, as we continue on, Nathan the prophet comes to David, and he says in verse number 9, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in this sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and take, hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. God said unto David, he said, because you've disobeyed me and you've sinned, now the sword has come into your life. Now, this problem will continue to grow. And for the rest of your life, you'll have this sword that you'll have to deal with. And I believe as a direct result, because if you look, where does the trouble start with Absalom? The next chapter. The very next chapter, chapter 13. And the first thing that I'd like for us to notice this morning about this that led Absalom down these paths of destruction was that he tried to fix a problem himself. He tried to fix a problem himself. Have you ever had a difficult problem? In our elementary class, we'll uh, be working with third grade, and we'll have these huge problems, and we'll go to the 10,000th place, and there will be like six different things that you have to add together, and every time I write it up on the board, it just gives me a headache, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm so thankful that Kristen is doing this and not me. And so we keep going. Why? Because it's, right, when we have problems, it causes us headaches. It causes us grief. Why? Because no one likes a problem, right? Honestly, because a problem means that it's upsetting something that's already going on. You have to, what? Find a solution. You have to find an answer. Now, God in the Christian life wants us to always go to him because he is the answer. He is always the answer. But we ought to be careful because Absalom, he had a problem. And we'll look at this here in just a moment. But Notice how he responded with this problem. If you'll look in chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, beginning in verse number 19, the word of God says, And Tamar put ashes on her head, and rent her garment of diverse colors that was on her, and laid her hand on her head, and went on crying. Just a little background, Absalom's sister Tamar had a brother named Amnon, and Amnon was in love with Tamar, and did something very wicked. We're not going to go into the whole story. It's in the beginning of chapter 13. But because of that, she lost her purity. And because of that, she's at this point where she's just in complete desolation. Now, in verse number 12, it says, And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Now, this is the last time we hear about Tamar. And it's a very sad thing, but he had this problem. Absalom did. No doubt, 
He cared so much for his sister. He wanted to do something for his sister. What about you? Has there ever been someone that you love very greatly that was hurt by someone? Maybe there was some situation that you could do nothing about it. You wanted to so hard. You said, if only I could have been there, I could have prevented this from happening. Have any of us been there? Oh, yeah, no doubt. I've been there in my own life. But what happened? Absalom tried to deal the problem himself. He tried to fix the problem himself. Let's keep reading verse 21. It says, But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon, because he had forced his sister Tamar. And it came to pass, after two full years, that Absalom had sheep shears in Behel Hazor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's son. Now we won't, for time's sake, read all this story, but what goes on next is that Absalom invites all the king's son two years later after this had taken place, two years after this awful incident. And two years later, he invites all the king's son. He tries to get King David to go, but King David won't let him, but he allows Amnon to go in his place. And so what happens, as we find out, is that Absalom had been plotting this whole time to kill Amnon. And we'll keep reading verse number 28. It says, Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon, as Absalom had commanded him. He had this problem. Absalom had this problem. A problem definitely that was a serious problem. A problem in the eyes of the world that would say, he needs to seek justice. He needs to seek revenge. This was a wrong that was done. And no doubt in the eyes of the world, in his own eyes, this was something that was okay. Why? Because he had been wronged. He had to do what was right. You know, if you're, if you're a man, you, you, you have to stick up for yourself, right? You can't, if someone takes away your pride, you have to stand up for yourself. No, you're not on my watch. You're going to do this. You know, that type of thing. And that's how Absalom approached this, though. He said, not on my watch. You're not going to do this with me here. He tried to fix this problem, notice, himself. Himself. Instead of letting the king handle this problem, he tried to handle it himself. Now, what he did was perhaps admirable in the eyes of the world. In the eyes of God, it was something awful. This was not the way that God intended for justice to be brought. God alone is the bringer of true justice. The Bible teaches us that. And vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But when we take a situation into our own hands, the only thing that will happen is we'll make it worse. We'll make it worse. So this was the first step for Absalom on his pathway down. But did you realize that there are problems, many problems that man can't handle, but two that every single person can't handle? And maybe for you today, these are one of these problems. And that's the problem of sin. The problem of sin. Did you realize you cannot have victory over sin on your own? You can't do it no matter how hard you try, no matter how good you are. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can't handle sin on your own. Not only that, the second problem is death. Did you realize no, no matter how hard you might try, no one has been immortal. Even people whom Jesus raised from the dead eventually died again. Like Lazarus, he's not still alive today, is he? No. No one's been ever immortal. So how do we deal with these problems? Well, we let our king fix our problems. Amen. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, God's only son, came to this earth, and he lived a sinless life, a perfect life, God in the flesh. And what he did on that cross was he took our sin upon him. He bled and died for our sake. He took our death upon him. And by that one incident, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he took the hands of us wicked sinners and the hand of the Almighty God, and he reconciled us to him. And then an amazing thing to think about, Jesus fixed our problem. The King of Kings fixed our problem. And did you realize that same King wants to fix whatever it is that you're dealing with today? He wants to, but are you so, like Absalom, full of yourself to try to fix it on your own? So we see that this is the first step in Absalom's desolation. But the second step is that he tried to justify himself. He justified himself. Again, in verse 28, he said to his servants there, he says, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. He tried to encourage him, encourage his men to do sin. 
He tried to encourage these men to murder this man. Now the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 15, He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. Do you realize that we can't go on trying to do things in our own strength, in our own ability, having our pet sins, and justifying it as okay? The Bible says that we cannot justify ourselves. The only true justification is through, again, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Galatians 2, verse 16, it says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So we're unable to justify ourselves by any work that we do. We can't do it. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not the works of the law, for by works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Have you been trying to justify your own? Maybe you're doing something that no one else knows about. Maybe watching things on your computer or your television that you really hope that no one will ever find out about. Maybe you're doing things, talking to people that you hope that no one knows. You're trying to justify, ease your conscience by saying that, well, I go to church on Sunday and I, you know, I pay my tithe and I do this and that and the other. I'm a good person. Well, the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. May we realize that there's nothing that we can do to justify ourselves, no matter what action we may take. There's only one that we're justified with, God, and that's Jesus Christ. And I hope you're justified today. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you had your sins forgiven? Are you justified in the eyes of God? If not, he wants to today. He invites you. He says, whosoever will may come. He opens up the invitation. The Bible says he ripped, he ripped the veil in twain from the top to bottom, an impossible thing that any man could have done. And he opens the invitation for us to come to God. Have you come to God? Christian, what about you and your, your life? Have you come to God with your problems? Are you trying to just justify your downward smile, knowing that there's nothing that you can really do to get out of this hole that you've dug for yourself? Only God can deliver you. Only Jesus Christ, only the true king of kings. But not only did he try to fix his own problem, not only did he try to justify himself, but also he comforted himself. If you'll look in verse number uh, 37 of chapter 13. Verse 37, chapter 13. So after Absalom had had Amnon killed, all the king's men fled. And as you can imagine, a Absalom's probably pretty nervous now. He's got a target on his back, if you will. He had just had this man executed, and so now he is fleeing. And in verse 37, it says, But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. Now, just reading that, we wouldn't think that that really has any indication whatsoever. But if you look in 2 Samuel 3, uh, verse 3, it lists all of um, David's sons. And it gives a list of all the sons that he had with these wise and these concubines. And it's interesting is that one concubine was the name of Maka, And she was the daughter of Talmai, who is this king of Geshur. So in other words, what does that mean? It means that this man, this king that Absalom fled to, was his grandpa. Huh. It's interesting, isn't it? kind of puts it in a different perspective. Come to grandpa. <laughs> How many times have you gone to your grandparents whenever you, yeah, not getting along with your parents and you run to them? Yes. Right? Why do we do that? For comfort? For protection? Because we don't want to fess up to what we have done? Because we don't want to stand up for what we have done and sinned? And that's exactly what happened here with Absalom. He tried to comfort himself. He tried to console himself and say, oh, it's okay. Just run to grandfather. He's a king anyway, and so I'm technically a prince on both sides of the family. So it's okay. Everything is going to be okay. And we know that this was a good place because, again, in our text verse, he says, wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there. He said, why did you take me away from my grandfather? I was perfectly fine over there. He tried to comfort himself. But this comfort came between him and his king. Notice again that same verse, verse 37 of chapter 13. It says, And David mourned for his son every day. The heart of the king was heavy for his son. He loved his son so much. And he wanted to be, have a right relationship, a right fellowship with his son. But because his son didn't want anything to do with it, he fled to this other comfort. Maybe David and Absalom never really had a good relationship. And then when everything happened with Bathsheba and then Amnon, they never could. Absalom let these things come between him and his father. 
my challenge for you this morning, and I believe that the Lord is speaking to all of us about, is what comforts are we letting in our life come between us and God? Letting us, letting come between us and the King of Kings, the Almighty King. We're fleeing to this one comfort, this one crutch, if you will, this one thing that we know will help us and console us when we've messed up, we've, we've sinned, we've done something wrong. We're going to run to this one thing. Maybe a family member, maybe some type of addiction, maybe something. I don't know what it is, but what comforts are you running to instead of running to Jesus? You see that? Comforts, in the American mindset, we think that comfort is a good thing, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible teaches us that whosoever shall come after me shall take up his cross, shall deny himself and follow me, follow the Lord. He didn't promise that it was going to be a comfortable road. Was the road to Calvary comfortable? Was it clothed with pillows? Was it there with people greeting him? No. The, the road to Calvary was an awful road. It was a horrible road, yet Christ traveled it alone for you. So what comfort are we letting come between us and the great King of Kings? What if we let us turn aside and say, no, I'm not going to take up my cross. I'm going to take up this pillow and take a nap over here. No, it's ridiculous, but that's how our lives are anymore. We're letting our comforts take us away from the king. And when the king is sitting in his throne, and his heart is very sore, he's weeping every single day, wishing that his child would come back. What about you this morning? God loves you so much. Don't ever forget that. No matter how hard the devil might try to shake you into think that that's a lie, it's the biggest bunch of baloney you've ever heard. No, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He proved his love on the cross. He loves us so much. He says in Psalm 139 that the amount of times he thinks of us are the sand of the sea. Have you ever seen a grain of sand before? It's pretty, pretty tiny, isn't it? And if you just go down and you touch your hand on a seashore, if you've ever been on a coast there, and you see how many hundreds of grains of sand in just that one touch you pick up. It's amazing, isn't it? Now multiply that times the whole shore. That's how often God thinks of you. And how can we have the audacity to say that God doesn't love us? But yet how many times we find ourselves in this place of comfort instead of in Jerusalem with the King of Kings. Oh, how may the Lord help us to flee to Him and to flee to Him away from our comforts. Not only that, also... The next thing is that he not only comforted himself, but he pampered himself. We see that this thing is continual downward cycle. In chapter 14, uh, an account takes place where Joab urges David to bring Absalom back. He sees what it's doing to his heart, and so he does, and he brings him back. And King David says, I don't want to see him right now. Just let him go back to his place. And then it says in verse number 25 of 2 Samuel 14, but in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. When he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. And so what's interesting here is it gives a little description about Absalom's character and how that he was a very beautiful person, that he was a very handsome person, and that what he did was he purposefully let his hair grow out, and so he didn't get a haircut until the end of the year. Now, it may, I know the ladies don't get their haircuts very often, but I have to get my haircut about once a month, or else it's going to drive me nuts, because it's all over the place and it's crazy. And I can't even imagine how long it must have been for one, just one full year. Then not only that, if you look at the weight, it says, it says it was 200 shekels. Now, looking up, they don't know the exact amount of that equivalence today, but the closest uh, that I found of all the people I was looking at said about close to five pounds in weight for hair. Think about that just for a minute. Five pounds. That's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of hair. But why did he let it grow out? Why did he make a spectacle of himself? Because he was seeking people's approval. Because he was trying to pamper himself. He was trying to get people to love him for who he was. And if we're not careful, we can become the same way. Are we concerned more about the affection of people or the affection of the Lord? Are we more concerned about what people think of us? Or are we more concerned about what Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, thinks of us? The Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 25, it says, The fear of man brings a snare. 
but whoso put this trust in the Lord shall be safe. If we're to put our trust in other people, then no doubt they're going to fail us. No doubt we'll never be able to get anyone's approval. Why? Because it's all over the place. Because <laughs> by the time we get done pleasing this one person, then someone else will be upset, you know? But no, our ultimate goal, to please the King of Kings, to please the Lord himself. But then lastly, the last thing we see that led Absalom on this downward spiral. Not only did he pamper himself, he comforted himself. He tried to fix his problem himself. He satisfied himself. He satisfied himself. You know, something that's interesting about the character of Absalom is that he always got what he wanted. He always got what he wanted. And if we'll notice, again, back in our text verses, in verse number 28, it says, Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Now, I don't believe that was a, a result of the fact that King David didn't want to see him that whole time. I believe that was the fact that Absalom didn't want to see King David because he had every opportunity. It was two full years. He could have gone to the king any time, but yet he waited and then whenever he finally decides he does want to sing King David or figure out why he's here, he tries to go to, uh, to Joab, the captain of the guard. And instead of, you know, he, it's just kind of a comical story almost, he says that he sent word into him, and then he didn't come to him. And then he sends him again a second time, and he doesn't come to him. And so finally he says, all right, I've had enough of this guy. This field's next door. I want you guys to go set his field on fire. And that'll get his attention. Then he'll come to us. And sure enough, he did. But why did he do that? Because he got what he wanted. Because he had people who would serve him. And so he knew that if there was something he wanted, he's going to do anything he did, anything he could to get it. What's interesting, look at verse number 32, if you would, please. It says, And Absalom answered Joab. There is, he uses the, the, the personal pronoun seven times here. Look at this. It says, Behold, I sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, that I may send thee to the king, to say, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me at, to have been there still. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face. If there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. Do you see that? In one verse, he's so focused on who? Himself. Did he ever wonder why God had brought him there? Why was he come? What purpose was he there? Why was he in Jerusalem instead of Geshur? Because the king had brought him there. Because the king loved him. And you know what's amazing about this whole story, if you look in the last verse, verse 33, says that he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. You know what the king should have done? He should have said, you deserve to at least go to prison, you know, for killing Amnon. He should have judged him. But you know what the king did? He kissed him. He showed him his love for him. This reminds me just of like the, the parable that Christ gave in the New Testament in Luke chapter 15 where it talks about the prodigal son and how when the prodigal finally comes to himself and he comes back home, instead of the father saying, I told you you're going to waste your life, what did he do? He says he ran to him, right? And he kissed him. And he showed him how much he loved him. And you know, this morning, God loves you, even despite all that we have done against him. And the interesting thing is that he saw things only from his own personal perspective. It says, seeing it from God's perspective, seeing it from the king's perspective. And the king, he loved Absalom so much, and he showed his affection towards him. He just gave him a big old hug and kiss and said, I'm just so glad you're here. Now, the Bible doesn't give us clarity about what happens right after this, but as you can imagine, the king loved his son. But the son didn't see that. All he saw was, again, verse number 32, it had been good for me. It had been good for me. So my question for you this morning is what, is you, what are you looking at your life are you serving the king or are you serving yourself? Are you serving for the praise of others? Are you serving to get some type of comfort, to get some type of reward? Are you trying to fix some type of problem on your own? Or are you serving the king? Are you realizing that he is the answer to all the problems? Are you realizing that he wants to be there and to help you and to be the comfort that only he can be to you? There's this very clear distinction of those who serve a life that's dedicated to Jesus Christ and those that, as F.B. Meyer called it, the self-life. The self-life. 
Which one are you living today? Are you living for yourselves? You say, but I'm a Christian for the rooks. That doesn't mean any difference. If you're a Christian, we can still live for ourselves. Absalom was still the king's son, was he not? He was still the son of the king. We ought to be very careful. The Bible says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We ought to be so careful in our life to not be so quick to point the fingers at others and realize that God's pointing the finger at us, that we are the problem, that we can't do this life in our own strength, that it's not something of our own self or own ability that can do anything because there is none good, no, not one. But how can we have victory? I believe the Bible tells us by coming into the presence of the king, by coming to the king of kings, coming to the foot of the cross and realizing that there's nothing good in us, but just acknowledging that all that we need is in you.